Good morning, a good day wherever you are on this planet. And we're going to be celebrating the 50th Earth Day uh, here at the Earth Institute at Columbia University today. With me is Alex Halliday, the director of the Earth Institute. We're going to be looking back and moving forward. And it, it's an exciting time, but it's also a sober, a sober time for all of us because we, we, we all know how many people are working hard to uh, maintain functionality of basic resources and needs we have, whether it's in hospital wards or whether it's in fields at, at farms or whether it's uh, processing plants for the food and the milk uh, we drink. So a brief initial word of respect and honor to those and also to those who've lost uh, loved ones or who are um, fighting for life right now. It's uh, it's an amazing time. It's also um, an extremely unnerving time. So Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the day. Hi, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our special Earth Day 5050 webcast. We stand today at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but at the same time facing a public health emergency of global scale, as well as a slower moving, but also urgent environmental crisis from climate change. The Earth Institute has world-renowned researchers, experts, and people who work with people in policy, et cetera, uh, concerned with areas as different as environmental conditions that lead to infectious diseases, how to deal with disasters, how to prepare for them, and how to plan when they happen. And then, of course, we also have our world-leading climate scientists and people concerned with sustainability more broadly. Uh, the Earth Institute is, at its heart, a transdisciplinary organization. And we recognize that the problems we face today are incredibly hard and they require thinking across a range of disciplines if we're gonna really come up with solutions that will work and have a meaningful impact on society. Uh, our work has never been more um, relevant and actually never been more urgent. So for the next 90 minutes, we've got two generations of our leaders on sustainability issues and on solutions who will share perspectives uh, and answer your questions regarding the state of our planet, uh, both then, 50 years ago and now, and our vision for the future, both uh, generally what we're doing here at Columbia, but also more broadly in terms of how society might play out in the future. And Andy is gonna lead us through the discussion. Over to you, Andy. Thanks, Alex. Um, and we're gonna start with a look at the foundational knowledge base and how it came about, science, the basic science that underpins everything. If we don't start with data, including what we don't know, then we don't have directionality for policy. So the a great person to start that conversation is Maureen Ramo, who is the Bruce C. Hazen Lamont Research Professor at uh, Columbia University. Uh, and she is at the uh, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which celebrated its 75th anniversary recently and is a, just one of the great hubs on the planet for Earth, ocean, and climate research. So I'm going to bring Maureen uh, to the fore here. Maureen, how are things going where you are in the Hudson, lower Hudson Valley? Very good. Thank you. Hi, Andy. Hi, Alex. Happy uh, Earth. Happy Earth Day. Yeah. Um, there, there are. You know, it it is worth stepping back. We're facing enormous struggles, and uh, at the same time, I can't think of a better to, time. That's okay. I can't think I'm of. Trying a better to get out of the sun. <laughs> ah, you look okay. It's pretty good. I can't think of a better time than right now after we've had this great acceleration. That's what scientists call, call the last 50 years recently. We're now in a great pause. And, uh, you know, many of us are immobilized essentially uh, for, for good reason. So it's a good time to reflect a little bit. So Maureen, uh, we thought you could take us on a little bit of a tour through uh, what we've learned so far and where we go from here. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about uh, climate and climate science. Um, from really from a little bit of a personal perspective. When I graduated from college in 1982 from Brown, um, I wanted, I was a geology major. I wanted to study Earth's climate history. And there was only one place in the world to do that as far as I was concerned, and that was Columbia University and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, and that's, as you see a picture of the Lamont campus up on the Palisades Sill, just north of New York on the screen there. And so that was the only place I applied. I ended up going there and doing my graduate work. And it was an incredibly exciting place to be. Wally Broker, you know, Lamont ships had been exploring the oceans for decades. Lamont scientists had been exploring the poles. 
Wally Broker, shown here in the upper right, had, had published a paper a few years ago predicting that we were on the cusp of a pronounced global warming because of the increased CO2 in the atmosphere due to fossil fuel combustion. Um, a few years after that, J Jim Hayes, who's, who's still at Lamont, uh, one of my old professors, uh, published, he's here right here on the lower right, published a paper with his colleagues showing for the first time, proving that subtle changes in Earth's climate, the ice ages waxing and waning over uh, North America and Europe were caused by very subtle changes in, in the Earth's sun distance. So, you know, proving beyond a doubt how, how delicately poised the climate system was. And again, all of this was just feeding on this excitement of, of learning how and why Earth's climate changed and realizing at the same time that we were in the middle of a profound change. Um, by the late 80s, it was clear that, that the rate of warming of the planet had accelerated. We had Jim Hansen um, also working at Columbia uh, testifying to Congress that, that climate models were predicting this warming and that it was going to continue. And, um, and it has continued. Not only has it continued, the warming has accelerated. And uh, and I'm still I'm at Lamont. I left, but I came back to Lamont about ten years ago. I'm, I'm now the director in the lab. I did my graduate research in uh, so many years ago. Um, but what's really great is Lamont is still an incredibly exciting place to work. is still the top ranked earth science research department in the country. We have scientists studying all aspects of earth history and climate from sea level rise to droughts to predicting el ninos to creating the information that people can use to adapt and uh, really cope with the changes we are seeing around the world so uh, i'm really happy to be here uh, it's very exciting what's not so exciting is that co2 in the atmosphere continues to inexorably rise i mean that is very much another curve that needs to be flattened uh, very quickly. For sure. And that gets to some of the broader initiatives at, um, at uh, Columbia and at the Earth Institute that are kind of linked in. What's really so impressive to me about Columbia is that interlacing that happens and uh, that intersection of the basic science, illuminating past patterns current dynamics and using models and other uh, ways to project the future and then integrating it into how the world works and what we do. Uh, the managed retreat conference that happened yet, right as I started here was, a, I thought, a great a great kind of uh, coalescing of all of those threads. Alex, it's a good moment for you to uh, take the floor and explain a little bit more about the the broader picture here. Uh, you know, you, you've been here for, I think, two years now, which is probably just enough to, to really get to start to understand the ecosystem of Columbia University, which extends globally and is so amazing. And actually, I wanted to show this slide. Uh, just last week, we had this um, yet another paper showing how the past illuminates the present and the future. This is Park Williams' work. Uh, you know, it seems boring to collect uh, tree ring uh, samples and put them in a, in a, in a kind of a museum, at, you know, a repository, but then it's a way to, you don't really know what's unprecedented or or the like until you know the past. And this is a critical part of what's going on here. So Alex, uh, take us through uh, the bigger dynamics here. Sure, well, thanks a lot, Andy. Um, I mean, I think Park Williams' uh, paper, which just came out in Science, is a great example of what Columbia can do because Park was the first author, but there were a number of other Earth Institute authors on there. And the opportunity the Earth Institute has is to take its tree ring lab out of Lamont, which is it's not the biggest tree ring lab in the world, uh, but it's actually, um, it, as, it does work globally uh, more effectively than any other tree ring lab in America, as far as I can tell. But it also works with people who are climate modelers and actually achieves a huge amount to tackle some of the major issues that we look, uh, we're looking at going forward. So that particular piece of work uh, that's just come out uh, using the tree ring data was allowed them to model the uh, impacts in terms of drought going back and show that actually we're um, getting into, we're already in a mega drought uh, that is comparable in scale to the worst that there have been since records began in the last 1200 years. And this is massively important. And it realized we don't actually know when this thing is gonna end or whether it's gonna get worse, 
but we are seeing the effects of climate change uh, making these natural droughts far, far worse. So they're now at the scale of mega drought. And so we can do that kind of work here. We can bring together people who work on drought from the point of view of historical records with people look, who look at water resources issues and uh, the, U the United States water resources issues, people who work on health issues, in particular people from the School of Public Health, which is very strong in environmental issues in particular. Um, and we can work also on things like ecosystems and, and food security and how food is affected by all of these things. So the net result is that just from the point of view of learning to live with climate change, the Earth Institute's got phenomenal uh, strength to actually try and address, get people to adapt to this major challenge going forward. But we've also got people who are brilliant at looking at the issue of um, how to slow it down. And we have great people working on, uh, we have one of the best battery technology centers here in the engineering school. We've also got an amazing team of people working on negative emissions. And we have great people like Mike Girard, who we will hear from in a minute, uh, who works on uh, not just environmental law, but actually uh, he's one of the leading players in terms of trying to figure out how the world can transition and actually decarbonize its economy, including the United States, of course. So we have these people, Jason Bordoff's amazing Center for Global Energy Policy, who really works with the policymakers very closely. And we bring it all together, and what you have is um, about roughly across the university, we reckon we've got close to a thousand people doing research on climate or very closely related issues. And this gives you phenomenal strength to develop new education models, uh, build uh, cutting edge research programs, um, but also engage in practice and really trying to take this work and uh, make it relevant to people on the ground, policymakers, people uh, working in their own environment where maybe they've got things to teach us, very often they do, about what, how, what, how their own environments are being affected by climate change. So that two-way interaction is hugely important. And that sort of leads to something else that we've been expanding, and, and Andy, you're a product of this, and that is communication. How do we actually talk to people around the issues of climate change build up the uh, the understanding uh, so that people understand the objective nature of it. And there's a very good reason why universities should do that. And that is because universities carry a lot of credibility in terms of trust with the, with the general public uh, in a way that many other organizations don't or, or spheres of life don't. So we have a lot to build on there. And that aspect of communication and trust is hugely important as we go forward. Um, yeah, uh, sorry. No, I was just going to say this. We we now just I'll quickly wrap up because I, I know I'm, I don't fine. want to give too much time. But we're now um, this this power of Columbia University to work in this area has been recognised by the trustees of the university, and also by President Bollinger. Um, and we're now looking at what else we can do. And there are uh, exciting ideas. We're now sort of designing um, uh, and actually getting to the design stage of this. Um, there are ideas about building a climate school, uh, and this is still something that's in development stage, but we're very excited about this, and actually with a, it'll focus on more than just climate, but the main focus will be on the climate challenge, and it's great to be at this university in particular, which I think is the best one for doing transdisciplinary work on this subject, uh, and actually making this happen here in particular. It's an, it's an amazing place, and, and we'll talk more about how things are evolving. Maybe evolving is too slow a word, how things have leaped yeah. forward uh, in the current coronavirus lockdown. I'll give one brief example that just came to mind and that I think illustrates the, the agility of Columbia's faculty and, and, and students all across the board. Seamus Khan, who's the chair of sociology, I was watching it with, wonder, with, with wonderment within a day or two of everything shutting down and schools scrambling to go online. He had assembled a, a website called uh, youthremotelearning.com with some colleagues in which teachers and and those of us stuck at home could post lessons and, and actually offer on a calendar, hey, I can teach this today. And not only that, remember he's a faculty, he's a tenured faculty. He doesn't need to do this, right? And he, but he built a course teaching young people today how to be an ethnographer. So how you today as a young a student in high school locked at home can chronicle your experience in a way that historians going forward will be able to uh, understand. It's just an amazing place that way. 
Yeah. Um, Maureen, uh, on this, one other thing to touch on perhaps is, uh, you know, we are, there is an infodemic around the pandemic and it's very reminiscent of the climate divide you see in the public sphere where um, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, some of them are professional naysayers and some are people who are culturally just won't accept climate science. This mm -hmm. uh, Alex touched on trust. And I don't know if you have your own sense of how, uh, along with building the science base, along with integrating with uh, policy expertise through Jason and and uh, and Mike Gerard and others, is there something else that we're doing or can do to build that sense of trust and engagement with broader communities? Yeah, well, I mean, to me, every opportunity I have to talk to people who are outside of the sciences, outside of academia, I embrace that opportunity. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, but, you know, I sense out in the world at large, there's a real hunger to learn more about climate change. And that's one thing that's made me really optimistic in the last five years. I've really felt that people are beginning to perceive that this is a, a problem that is going to impact them personally and want to learn more. And that's the first step to understanding and, and making decisions about your own actions. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, and I think the uh, I've been to a couple of the open houses that the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory hosts, and yeah, obviously we won't be having those until there's a uh, uh, people can interact with each other directly. But having uh, digital open houses like the one today, I think, can be helpful too. So we're going to move now. A a Andy, can I say one more thing? Of course. I, you know what you said about what the scientists are at Lamont and, and Columbia are doing. One of the scientists at Lamont with who studies very fine particles of air pollution with his son it just published a paper on how to disinfect masks uh, using their knowledge of air pollution and, the, and, and fine particles. And it was another example of just using the scientific method and, and, and what we know pivoting to a really important problem. That's it's fantastic. Really, yeah, it's yeah. super, super cool with his high school son. We have to it's get that published. On the, we have to get that on the blog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's already up there. Okay. And very, very Twitter worthy. I'll do that as soon as we're done. So now we're going to uh, jump uh, forward and back uh, to 1970. Uh, you know, when I talk about the Great Acceleration, which has been charted, uh, these last decades, this 50 years, those of us who are boomers, um, who my, my son's generation tend to point fingers at, we really did ride on a wave of prosperity and bigness that characterizes these last couple of generations. And the, at 1970, Earth Day One was one of the results of people recognizing there are these. Um, there's a downside to all this industrialization and progress, quote unquote. So uh, we have some people on campus who have, uh, or near campus, in, in Fred's case, have, have were there at day one. Uh, so Alex and and uh, Mo, I'm going to minimize your video, your images, so we can go to our new guests. And here's Mike Gerard. And Fred Kent, uh, great to see you both. Uh, hope you're safe and relatively sane. Uh, Fred, Fred, you're in Brooklyn. Uh, Mike, are you in Manhattan? Where are you? I'm in Westchester. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in Putnam County, a little further up. Um, and right. my, my friends and re relatives in the city are still struggling to just grasp the scope of what's happened. It's been amazing. But, but here, I think it's a good time to take the picture to pause even deeper and do the reflection part of what getting a sense for people of what the world was like, what Columbia was like, what New York City was like um, in that era way back when, uh, when this was a scene on April 22nd in New York City. And you'll see images in a few minutes showing that the Green New Deal push from students now is, has a similar feel. But um, so, but Fred, can we start with you on well, actually, I'm sorry, Mike, uh, who is Andrew Sabin, professor of professional practice at Columbia Law School, and he's the director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. And I have to say, Mike, one of your great qualities also is you're you're obsessively communicative, and that that isn't always true of law professors or people in this field in general. And you, like, I remember 25 years ago, maybe it was 30 years ago, when I was a young journalist in New York City. Um, reading your newsletter that was a printed, was it blue or green, the, the paper? Uh, green. It was green, of course. <laughs> so, but you were you were writing for the Columbia Spectator as, as a, could you just give us a word picture of what it was like back then and what you think the context was? Sure. So in April of 1970, I was a sophomore at Columbia. I was also a reporter for the Columbia Daily Spectator. 
and I volunteered to cover the first Earth Day. Um, I grew up in Charleston, West Virginia, which is a town dominated by the petrochemical industry that at the time had very high levels of air pollution and water pollution. And so I was already interested in the environment. So I uh, volunteered to cover uh, Earth Day for Spectator. Uh, the Columbia campus, like many uh, college campuses around the country, was consumed with protests against the Vietnam War. And there were also uh, civil rights protests, the uh, early protests of the women's movement. Some people thought that uh, Earth Day would be a distraction from the more important issues of, of the day. Uh, but, the, uh, but Earth Day went forward. This is the article I wrote covering it exactly 50 years ago today. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, there were uh, there was some unhappiness that among the speakers at the uh, in the Earth Day panels at Columbia were people from uh, Con Edison and General Motors who were at the time seen as the bad guys. But the uh, the programs uh, went forward nonetheless. Uh, the programs at Columbia on Earth Day were much uh, smaller than the uh, programs that uh, Fred Kent had helped organize downtown that received much larger turnouts. And um, what, what do you feel, thinking back now, was the context that drove this? Um, Fred's going to have his own ideas in a minute, but what, what drove you? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned your upbringing in a town with an energy industry, but was there anything else that propelled you? And, and what, why, why law well, it was, as the outcome? <laughs> yeah, it, it was becoming clear that law was really where the action was that was having an impact. Um, Nixon had just signed the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, the Earth Day uh, protests really galvanized the entire environmental movement and made it clear to Congress and to President Nixon that there was strong public support for action on, on the environment. So at the end of the 1970, we saw the Clean Air Act. Uh, and then in the decade to come was, was the great decade of environmental lawmaking, the Clean Water Act, the pesticide law, the hazardous waste laws uh, were all enacted in that decade. Um, then we had a few other laws up till 1990. 1990 is the last time that Congress has passed any major new environmental law. Since then, there's been political partisan paralysis. But during the 1970s, there was bipartisan consensus and most of these laws were passed by Congress with nearly unanimous votes and signed into law by Republican presidents. Those are the laws uh, from 40 and 50 years ago that we environmental lawyers are still working with today. And was that, do you, you know, history is no longer, is no, not always prologue to the future. You can't look to history and say, let's do that again. Or, and sometimes you can. So was that like a one-time thing in our history, do you think? Or can we find ever bipartisanship again? Or was, are we kind of locked into using the tools that are at hand and not thinking about new new options? Well, we're certainly hoping that we can see uh, bipartisanship again. Uh, before the COVID-19 crisis, we were seeing tremendous momentum building up in the United States and around the world led by young people to yeah. try to uh, act more assertively on climate change. And as the impacts of climate change get worse, which they will, hopefully we will have even more consensus and it would be wonderful to see a resumption of this bipartisanship. Great. So Fred, um, give people a sense of your context. This is Fred, Fred Kent, who's uh, the founder and director of uh, Project for Public Spaces and a new placemaking initiative that's a, a global effort to have people integrated better into how the landscapes around them and cityscapes around them are shaped. So Fred, it's great to have you with us. Oh, it's wonderful to be with you all and to hear all of the things that are going on at Columbia University. And, you know, Columbia really uh, grabbed me and New York grabbed me when I came down from Andover, Massachusetts, where I was living. And I was radicalized. Uh, there were so many things going on, so many things that were really not working well. And I think people were really, it was a, an amazingly uh, creative time uh, uh, where people had to do things. You couldn't just sort of sit by and, and watch and, and not think that you could have some impact. So I 
at Columbia when I was an undergraduate. I, as I left that, I started a, a street academy called Able Academy for Black and Latin Education in Manhattan Valley, trying to help solve some of the urban problems, especially among young people. And then I went to a bank for two years and then came back and started doing graduate courses at Columbia and used Columbia as a, uh, as a place where I could really explore all kinds of things because Earth Day to me was obviously about uh, the natural environment, but it was also about the human environment. And I uh, studied with Margaret Mead, who was an extraordinary influence on my life along with other people at Columbia and then other people at Berkeley. Uh, I got a grounding in really what public space and the life of communities, the social life of communities, uh, and that got me to start Project for Public Spaces, where we started working on uh, public spaces, and we redid Bryant Park, uh, uh, Rock Falls Center, and uh, Port Authority bus terminal, some of the most disastrous places in the, in, the, in the world at that time. Port Authority bus terminal was the worst right. public space I'd ever seen. And then moving forward, it gradually became something called placemaking, when we kind of morphed into the idea that uh, placemaking is really led by communities. And we did a book and the first principle of the book was the community is the expert. And the second was uh, you're creating a place, not just a design. The third was you can't, you, you, know, you can't do it alone. And the fourth was the best one is if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. So we were people who really pushed against uh, the existing structure of government and everything. And we moved it up to today where all of a sudden now placemaking, which was a quiet movement, is now a uh, becoming a major global movement. And at the end, I'll kind of talk about where that goes because it really can have a big impact on all of the work that you're doing from the human communities uh, uh, level. Yeah, that and that's something actually a month ago, I was supposed to run a session in, in Texas at South by Southwest on uh, how to empower community capacity, not only to shape its own future, but to spill its knowledge and learning on whether it's clean energy or resilience to, to other communities. Um, we'll be pushing forward with that for sure in the communication initiative I'm doing. Uh, and I've seen it a little bit even here in COVID, in our COVID moment, uh, a week ago on this broadcast, I visited Bhopal, India, where a community that had organized around one purpose within Bhopal uh, to do a plastic reduction campaign, dove in when they realized that the community faced a new risk uh, where poor people couldn't get any food under the lockdown. And they used WhatsApp as a community connecting tool to get food across this sprawling city to uh, the people who need it. So these community capacities seems to be a big part of what we could work on going forward. Well, and just to, to close on this part, uh, placemaking is something that everyone can become part of. It isn't a discipline. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. It's a way of bringing people together. Uh, in a sense, it gets us away from the kind of div division that we have into collective uh, responsibility, shared responsibility, and shared outcomes. So you can't really be operating in the political world when you're operating in the placemaking world. Right. So... Um Mike, you're going to have to leave us shortly for another session. Uh, so you won't have the opportunity to be part of our envisioning exercise. So I thought maybe I'd give you the chance right now. When you think ahead, and, and Fred cogently argued yesterday when we were talking about 2070, Earth Day 100, being way too far in the future. But you know, when you think of climate solutions, they have to integrate those kinds of timescales. So what's if you knowing what you know about the way the world works now, and knowing we've had this great jolt and knowing what, what in your head feels like progress in the next few couple of generations, what would you say is a step forward that can uh, really get us going in the right direction? We really need to be moving systematically away from fossil fuels. We need to be decarbonizing the economies of the world. Uh, at the uh, Sabin Center, we're helping to lead a project called Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization, uh, based on some technical work done at uh, by engineers and scientists at Columbia and elsewhere, um, laying out how the um, electricity system can trans transition entirely to or almost entirely to renewables, how the transport system and uh, and heating uh, 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 buildings uh, can move to electricity 
all of that electricity powered by clean sources. And we're developing the legal tools to do that. Uh, uh, we put out a big uh, book with the legal techniques. We've recruited more than 20 law firms on a pro bono basis to draft the laws that are necessary in order to carry that out. And we're looking for more. Uh, so I think a major task of the next generation is this decarbonization effort to move away from fossil fuels uh, uh, toward clean energy. And Columbia scientists, as well as policy people and lawyers, are really in the forefront of helping to make that happen. It's so interesting. And what you what you just described perfectly articulates the intersection of science, uh, technology, engineering, and law. You can't get there from here without knowing those how those disciplines intersect. You know, it's when we were talking in recent months about New York State's very ambitious laws related to decarbonization, and universities have to play a key role in for fostering that. Uh, New York State has, of course, some of the great universities on the, in the planet, and if if we all can connect and serve as as much as an extension service for communities around the state um, right. as as we can, doing the scholarship and the the, the idea building, I think. You're right. We could be on a good track. So speaking of, and, and let me just say yeah. the reason I need to log off is to give a presentation about New York's new uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act to a big webinar putting on put on by the New York City Bar Association. We're training uh, the lawyers of the city and the state in what that new law is and how to use it. That's great. Well, that's that's a good use of your time. So we we will say farewell to you uh, shortly and. Uh, of course, we'll all reconvene in person when we can sometime down the line. Mike, it's great to have you on today. Thank you. And you can come back too. This is, I'm doing this every week, at least several times a week. Great. So, uh, but we mentioned the future. And so now it's time to hear from the folks who will inhabit the future more than those of us with gray hair and who can remember the 60s. Um, we're going to go to the students here on this broadcast. Um, Fred, you're going to come back for our envisioning. Um, yeah. And Mike, we'll see you again down the line. And on Twitter, you're a very active. Um, I always love when I see folks uh, from my generation and older who adopted these new tools uh, with them and vigor. So see you on Twitter too. Thank you. And now you're going to meet uh, two exciting people from the generation who, again, has the highest likelihood of being uh, on this planet in 2070 at Earth Day 100 certainly much higher than than me. And um, I think it's reflective to look at this picture of 1970 Earth Day, and then fast forward to uh, this past year when the Green New Deal was proposed, which was a pretty amazing vision of a systems-based approach to decarbonization. Um, I, I think it's key for people to think of a Green New Deal that fits in their head, as opposed to some strict Green New Deal that's a something everyone has to fight to agree on. It's, it's a complex path going forward. And to uh, Maria Chart, who is uh, an undergraduate in engineering at the School of, Envi of Engineering and Applied Science, you're graduating next year, right? Yeah, next year. And you're in the, U in the UK, you're in the Southwest uh, coast. Yeah. Uh, well, not the coast, uh, sort of the Midlands in the South. <laughs> no, I can't say Midlands because that's like a particular <laughs> part. You're in the middle of the Southern part of the UK. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Narayan, uh, sorry, Narayan Subramanian, you are uh, got your undergraduate degree in engineering as well. I, uh, we'll talk about that about engineering, but now you're getting you're graduating from the law school this this spring uh, in a very weird and dis disturbed way, of course, given the, the state of things. But I'm confident you'll get through. And I would like to hear from you at some point about data for progress, where you're also a fellow. But I'd like you to sort of, we're now in the present. We've come back from 1970 to Earth Day 50, 2020. And Maria, I thought we'd start with you. You're, you've been part of campus activities that I think are so impressive. EcoReps is a, I think the biggest environmental group on campus. Is it the oldest too? Perhaps it's, it's uh, sort of pretty I don't think it's mature. the oldest, but it's well, been around since 2005. Yeah. And, um, you know, what? what's your sense of the ecosystem at Columbia? What made it particularly uh fertile ground for what's you know what you see as needed and just describe a little bit some of the things you've been up to um so i think as you've seen already um activism has always been a big part of columbia's identity um and that's definitely still true today as you can see with the green new deal um the work that sunrise and 
Extinction Rebellion are doing is very important and very impressive. Um, personally, my place within the like the environmental community at Columbia is more on the education side. Um, we've talked a lot about communication, education, um, eco reps, concentrates on educating the wider Columbia community as well as communities within New York. Um, so actually, on March sixth, which was the last day that we were all on campus, um, we hosted a youth climate summit for. 200 high school students, um, all five boroughs, a couple of people from New, York, um, New Jersey, as far away as Connecticut, um, came to our campus and yeah, here, here's there some pictures. Um, yeah, spent a day learning about how they can make an impact on the climate crisis within their communities. Um, and then the day finished off with each school making an action plan. And that was uh, quite think, a day, right? I think the president of Finland was on campus that day. Yeah, so actually, um, I think seven of the students went to an event with the president of Finland with the World Leaders Forum as well. Um, okay. It was talking about like the interdisciplinary nature of Columbia. Um, I was looking at who we had for speakers and we actually had representatives of six different institutions and departments within Columbia. Um, and just that, the fact that they go and, um, volunteered their time to help out high school students, um, asked by undergraduates who they had never met before, and really put on an amazing event for these students that inspired them all, whether they, some students already had um, great environmental programs at their schools and were looking into like setting up research programs. Other students knew very little coming in about the climate and environment um, and were kind of hoping to, within the next 12 months, stop their um, dining halls use using unreusable um, like paper plates and stuff. So it was a big range of students. Um, it was really amazing to see what they came up with and kind of the power of education. Um, yeah, it was very yeah. interesting. And that, that, that what you just mentioned about other parts of Columbia kind of diving in again gets back to this um, characteristic that I've seen that I really like about the university where that's sort of like the reflex is to do that. I've been at many institutions, even the New York Times, where the um, different desks don't cooperate. They're actually mostly defensive. They, you know, it's my budget, it's my thing. And at Columbia, I've met individuals throughout the school, sociology, um, teachers college particularly, who are all about diving in and seeing what part of some challenge they can help with. We're, we've been building, one of the things I started doing when I got here late last summer was to try to build a network, focus on communication innovation, but really it's a way for Columbia to speak to itself and the wider world uh, when, when that makes sense in ways that can fast forward some of our projects and make sure no one's missing an idea that's sitting somewhere great, somewhere on campus that's brilliant, but locked away because of a d disciplinary wall and the like. So that, that's just fantastic. And by the way, the other thing that I thought was wonderful about your summits, uh, that Silas and others um, have helped to build is they become a replicable model. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, Silas actually is, you can see him in this picture speaking. Um, this was his brainchild. He's a junior as well. We came in freshman year and he walked into Eco Reps and was like, guys, we're gonna do a youth climate summit. Um, and I kind of got whisked up in this amazing idea. So we hosted our first one freshman year, had like 70 students. It was very messy. We had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Um, and then fast forward two years and we have this amazing event. Um, and actually we've inspired, I think six other summits being run by other universities, high schools and the New York City Department of Education. So just the reach of this event has been really impressive and like far beyond what we imagined three years ago. And I think it just briefly, it gets back to what I was saying about community capacity. Here you're talking about students as a community having the capacity not only to hold an event or convening around an issue, like how do we re reduce food waste at our school, but then to, to spread that joy to others as well. So it becomes, that's, as a communicator, that's what excites me uh, beyond just writing a better story, which you know, I did for 30 years. Um, I think building better conversations is a keystone to going forward and, and we're demonstrating how that can happen. So yeah, that's definitely. great. So Narayan uh, Subramanian, you're, coming out of the law school, you came from engineering as Maria did. I guess maybe I'll ask you both briefly before we go on to the next question and Narayan's work. Um, what is it about engineers that makes them particularly tuned into the world uh, problems around us? I've found this everywhere, Arizona State. There, there are people I know everywhere who had some background in engineering, many in Columbia, who 
Is it because they're the doers and the builders? And what, what is it about engineering that is special to this field, this question? Maybe Narayan, you start and then yeah. Maria. Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously I think engineering teaches you uh, a lot of tools um, about how, how to practically apply science and, and, and knowledge. But I think there's something actually unique about Columbia engineers, uh, and that's because the core curriculum is such a key part um, of, of of Columbia, um, and whether you're an engineer or you're in the college, um, you're taking the core cur curriculum, which means you're exposing yourself to the classics, uh, everything from literary classics to also philosophical classics. Huh. And I think that's so important because it kind of grounds uh, your thinking, um, even as an engineer. And the other other aspect of being a Columbia engineer, as uh, Maria was pointing out, is just the sheer level of interaction with all the different departments and schools uh, across the university. <laughs> and I think that really shapes uh, you're thinking as well. So I think there's something unique about Columbia engineering uh, in, in the field of engineering itself. And Maria? Yeah, I think that's certainly true. Um, actually, a big part of the reason I came to Columbia was leaving the UK. I wanted an experience where I had more of a liberal arts education as well as engineering. Um, and with the Columbia core, that's the best place to have that, in my opinion. Um, also, I think just like the systems approach to learning and to like understanding the world is Climate change is like the biggest systems challenge, I believe, right now, because um, everything is so linked. And I think engineers kind of are trained to think about in that way and see all those links. Um, yeah. And Alex, uh, I brought you back into the conversation because your background in geochemistry could have been scholarly mainly, but you're also very much an applied science kind of person. You develop tools, not just uh, ideas. Um, can you speak to that briefly before we, we then look at the campus dynamics from your standpoint too? Just, is there something about, uh, there are two guys, Dan Kamen at uh, Berkeley and Michael Dove at Yale in 1997 wrote a paper they called the virtues of mundane science. And they use the word mundane, you know, as a provocation obviously, but it's about applying our knowledge to problems in the world. So, so Alex, you know, that seems to drive you a lot too is, is there something particular that pulled you here to Columbia to pursue that from Oxford? So I think the um, uh, there there are two. Well, just to talk about me and my interest in in technology, uh, I've always found that my research has been driven by um, innovation and technology. So if you develop new techniques, and you know Maria's a, a Cornish person, so she knows all about this. But <laughs> there's this. Um, guy called Humphrey Davy. He did a few pretty amazing things like discovering sodium and a few other things. Um, but he, one of his great lines was nothing begets good science so much as the development of a good instrument. And he realized that actually, if you're gonna make discoveries, you've got to figure out what you can do that might be innovative and new in terms of the technology that's needed. So I think engineering and technology are hugely important for the future of, of society on so many different fronts. And of course, we see that in our entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, we need to see it in governments, uh, putting money behind um, innovation in particular. Uh, some countries are particularly good at taking risks in innovation. America is one of them. And I think that's going to be really important. A lot of people who are interested in investing in the, uh, finding problems, uh, solutions to the climate change problem really want to see people taking risks. They're not interested any longer in sort of long-term you know, what we can do over the next hundred years. They want people to take big risks right now and they'll put money behind those big risk taking uh, 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 opportunities to develop new technologies and thoughts. So engineering, I think, is key to this whole, um, in so many aspects of what we're trying to do here. Um, but in terms of applying ourselves to the real world, um, the Earth Institute recognizes, as do many other people, of course, that fundamentally this is all about people. And how do you actually um, engage with people? And there's, there's, there's a tendency for universities, um, uh, we call them ivory towers for a pretty good reason, uh, that they tend to be a little bit isolated from the real world. And not only is this um, important from the point of view of you know, coming up with solutions that can actually help people, it's also a question of whether you really think you're gonna solve the climate problem without listening to people. And so we have to find good ways of engaging with communities, both here in New York City, including where we're building our campuses and things like that, um, but also uh, globally. 
Uh, so the managed retreat conference that you mentioned earlier, which was um, a few hundred people. It was the first time anybody had done a conference called managed retreat. First time I think the term had been used. Um, but it was, um, you know, a large number of those people who came to that first conference were journalists because they realized a lot of this was about, we, there was a lot to be done in terms of communication around this issue. And a lot of the other people who came along were people from communities around the world that are really impacted by the effects of climate change. And, you know, you can come up with all your own ideas about what you need to do to um, adapt to climate change. But these people are already doing it and they're out there in their own communities doing it. I think universities have got to become much more porous, much more open and much more connected to the real world and actually make people from the outside uh, much more you know, a part of what we're doing on the inside. That's an incredibly important lesson that we think we, we're trying to make part of the new climate school, that actually will have um, the structure like no other school and will actually have very open, uh, porous uh, boundaries to it that will not only connect with the rest of the university, but actually connect with the region and New York City and state uh, with uh, via direct portals that allow people to come in, but also allow people to become part of it effectively, even if they are uh, employed somewhere else. And similarly, we've got these great global centers around the world that actually give us the chance to do another managed retreat conference, which we could do in Mumbai, say, or something like that. So building up that global connectivity around these issues and, and sense of, of um, listening, as well as coming up with solutions, I think is a really important part of it. The last thing I just want to quickly say about that is that there are some in, in you could say, well, why build a school? And uh, one of the reasons we want to do this is we because we think that not only are the problems complicated and transdisciplinary and, you, they, and so big that we need to deal with them, there are certain disciplines that we just don't think are big enough or even exist on a proper scale right now. You could say that the issue of ethics is massively important to the future of the planet. And how big are we in terms of studying climate change in the context of ethics? Similarly, you could say same same is true of law. I mean, Mike Gerard is great, but actually we need about 50 Mike Gerards at Columbia working on this kind of thing. So you know, how, how do we actually build up these subjects in a way that are going to be really important? And I know we're going to be talking about what the world will look like in 50 years' time, but it strikes me that um, thinking about what a university should be trying to do to um, develop for the future, for future generations, for students, of course, who are going to become leaders, um, but also for uh, the disciplines they need to understand and the, the know-how we need. That's massively important. I agree. Um, so before we head into the envisioning exercise and start to get through some of the questions that have come in that are really good, um, and I encourage others who are listening to uh, share this with people live, we're going to be on for another half hour or so. Uh, share this with your friends on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. It's actually streaming for the first time live on LinkedIn. So uh, go to linkedin.com slash IN slash Andy Revkin and you'll find it. Um, share the questions, but I wanted to ask you guys about this moment too on campus where we are disconnected. Here we are connecting digitally. Um, we're not in our classrooms at Morningside or elsewhere. And just to get a brief reflection from, from the three of you on how this is changing or not, the way you've thought about your own career or your own goals. Uh, maybe we'll start with Maria. Um, and I just posted here, I just noticed uh, some images that kind of reflect the transition. There's Brighton Ka Kaoma, who's graduating, getting his master's degree in uh, policy administration. He was a Zambian uh, radio journalist as a teenager. And we have, we were meeting with Maya Lin, a great artist to, to work with her face to face. Uh, on some new projects he was working on. But on the right, we have some of the digital innovations that have happened here. Ra Radhika Iyengar, who's at the Center for Sustainable Development, dove into the online space and created uh, with, with Brighton. A, 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 this was a uh, workshop for kids wherever they are on how to use radio or podcasting as a teenager. And I launched this, uh, this actual Sustain What? effort that's looking at the uh, the landscape of journalism and media. So every one of us has had to kind of flurry around. Some of that's just a quick response, though. So what is, is there something about the jog to our global system that's 
gotten you thinking in a, in a new way about your own track, Maria? Um, so for me, I think it's definitely kind of illustrated the importance of activism. Um, I think our elected officials haven't dealt with this crisis in the way that we might have hoped. Um, in some countries, they've done significantly better than others, but um, I think it's really shown that having competent people in office is important and they are currently not necessarily. So have it using other streams to kind of get things changed um, is really important. Also, I think it's the first crisis that I have personally lived through. Um, and being in a crisis isn't great, it turns out. So I think <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of shown, like this is nothing compared to how badly we will be affected by the climate crisis if things don't change. And so I think it's really kind of illustrated the urgency of the situation and inspired me to kind of prioritize climate even more than I have already in my own life. Um, and especially kind of communicate better with my friends and family and make sure that this isn't something that's kind of ignored. Um, I know, especially in the first couple of weeks when you're getting kicked off campus and stuff, people were like, why are you trying to talk about climate now that we have something else going on? And that seems to be like a recurring theme within the climate discussion is that there's always something else, but these things are all linked. And I think for me, kind of telling people and Get, getting an understanding of how all of these systems are linked is something I've done and will continue to do, and hopefully other people will too, so we can actually deal with them more quickly. That's a good a good thought. And you know, and Narayan, uh, we were talking uh, yesterday about your work in the Marshall Islands and elsewhere in the world. Um, so, so as as we were saying, we we are the fortunate ones who have internet access here and have uh, the capacity to keep creating new ideas and spreading knowledge or policy or, or the like, but a big chunk of the world is, including in the United States, there are tens of millions of people who don't have access to the internet right now, the ones who need it most. So what's the jog to your system, if any, here so far, Narayan? Yeah, I think um, well, you, you really just described it there, which is there's also definitely an equity issue uh, that the coronavirus crisis is exposing, uh, which is very much true of the climate crisis as well. and. Uh, piggybacking on what, what Maria said, I think um, there's really something to learn about the climate crisis from the way in which the corona crisis, coronavirus crisis is unfolding. Um, some of the same aspects of denial of science or um, not acting in time, not being preemptive or proactive in your approach, um, that's all coming to bear with the coronavirus crisis. And so I think there's really something to be learned uh, as we move forward with the climate crisis. And so this, this whole experience really makes me want to redouble my efforts, but there's a lot to learn here too. And uh, to and that kind of on a more optimistic note, I think uh, there's an opportunity to get out of kind of the the ensuing economic crisis after this um, by actually doing the things we need to be doing uh, to tackle the climate crisis. So in some ways, I think uh, both these crises could actually be linked because, for example, we're seeing how uh, the global economy now is at a standstill, oil prices are collapsing, and there's a real opportunity to start the clean energy trans transition in earnest right now. So I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, on the climate crisis starting now, um, if, if not before. For sure. And Alex, um, hold on, let me get back to the, Alex, um, you know, this has been a jog to everything about a, how a university functions. And again, it's worth noting the, the heroes around us, or even on campus, especially Columbia with our public health and hospital intersection. It's just, you know, there are people who have passed away within uh, our family here. There's that direct and horrible effect, but, you know, thinking functionally going forward, uh, honoring their those losses and travails, what does it feel like now in terms in terms of how you would shape priorities for the Earth Institute itself going forward? So well, I'm glad you asked me to comment on this because I do think the university, as in many other universities um, globally, uh, you know, there's a huge focus on this right now, this current crisis, and it demonstrates uh, what can be done in terms of ingenuity. Um, and of course, what, what um, Maureen Raymo was talking about earlier, that somebody from Lamontas to Geosciences Laboratory, but this person works on pollution and they figured out how to disinfect masks. And, you know, it's masks that people are using all the time on the street. So if we run out of masks, we can, we can actually disinfect them. So, and this is a published paper, it's a piece of science. He's managed to get published in no time at all, uh, doing some 
uh, amazing uh, experiments just uh, put together rather quickly in their garage. You know, it's just incredible. So this sort of universities have got lots of super bright people uh, with ideas and motivation and passion. Uh, and this actually uh, is, is a great, to, it's great to see universities, you know, uh, jumping to the forefront, taking responsibility and trying to do things. It's also, of course, been quite interesting just to learn how much we actually don't need to fly, um, how much we don't need to uh, go to conferences. Maybe we can do, we can figure out how we're going to do conferences differently. Um, I think there are uh, interesting issues around uh, how people um, behave when they're under uh, stress uh, like this and how they respond to directives from government. I think that's been really interesting and a bit frightening um, in, in terms of some places seem to work well, and others seem to be uh, seem to generate anarchy. Um, so you just think, well, actually, there's a lot to learn about how we're going to adapt to climate change because there are going to be some difficult things for people to get used to in adapting to the effects of climate change and, and decarbonizing society. And while we think of it all as very positive, people are going to potentially have to give up their jobs and do something different with their lives, things like that, as we decarbonize the economy. And how is this going to affect society and what's going to respond to be? So I think there are a number of issues like that. I think one of the other issues that I think is really important is that um, people's mental well-being, their, you know, is, is being impacted by this crisis. People are seriously worried, of course. They're missing people. They're missing physical affection from people. They're missing, uh, they've got the, the, the fact that they're separated because they can't fly to go over and be with their loved ones. Um, there are tragic stories about this, which I think are, you know, very moving and and tell us about, I think, something about the fact that these major um, disasters, when they happen, and there will be more in different, different kinds in the future, um, they actually have a very strong human element to them, which we need to be thinking about and actually understanding how do we put in place the right kind of support mechanisms for people. And the interesting thing about this one is it's not you know, a part of the Caribbean that's being affected. It's not just um, a, a, an earthquake zone somewhere in Southeast Asia. It's actually the whole of the world is being impacted by this and they're having to live differently. And so we're all starting to experience stresses and psychological pressures that I think are, are, you know, we need to think about how do we maintain people's health. And in terms of the climate crisis, that's an issue. People are already, young people are worried about climate and we've got to make that something that we build up in our, in our thinking. How do we address that from a psychological point of view? It's actually an area that I've probably got more emails on when we talk about the climate school um, than any other area. People from across Columbia, many different schools actually said, look, we need to be working on this. This is really important. How do we help people adapt uh, psychologically to the impacts of climate? Yeah, there's this, um, actually uh, yeah, a woman who participated in the managed retreat meeting Susie Moser, hmm. uh, who's been in climate, cli climate adaptation thinking for a long time. She has a big project underway right now that I'm trying to get us integrated into um, on the adaptive mind. In other words, what are the capacities? How do you nurture in people the capacities to be agile, to be adaptive, to be empath em empathic, to be innovative? It's So it's less, uh, how do you learn physics than how, what is it we can foster in people that gives them the, the, those capacities to go through, whether it's climate adaptation or, or the next pandemic to make it the, the impacts last. So it's, and, the, and there's a whole bunch of people here at Columbia, Peter Coleman right now, this is his moment in a way he's at the uh, center called AC4. It's too, too long for me to disentangle for listeners, but he, he, they create among other things, they have a difficult conversations laboratory. And when I came here, the first thing I said, when I learned about that, I said, boy, the world needs more of that for sure. <laughs> so we have those capacities as well uh, here on campus. Um, so there's some great questions coming in, but we're gonna now go to our envisioning um, moment. Um, and I'm gonna bring in uh, our other guests who are still with us today, Fred and Maureen. So we have a couple of generations here. Um, we have this, pretty good articulation of where we've come from in the last 50 years, both in science and in the social life of our campus and our campuses around the world. 
the dynamics of the world right now are in flux. And with this great jolt, we've gone from the great acceleration to the great pause. A poet I had recently on this Sustain What program, Irene O'Garden, said this can be an era of the great compassion. That was her, her name for our moment because we've learned what disconnectedness feels like. So maybe we'll dive back into each other in a more meaningful way. And now we're going to go forward in time to pick your time. Uh, you know, I chose 2070 because it's easy to say, hey, it's the 50th anniversary of something. It's harder to say we're halfway to something. And uh, 2070, we know the world population will be over 9 billion. It'd be hard to imagine a trajectory that's not like that. We know that we'll have more technology unless things completely break down and we go back in profound ways that I don't think are going to happen. We know what universities, the universities' roles are changing. So I was hoping each of you could pick a, um, not the whole picture, but some part of the picture of the, the path ahead and articulate one or two steps that can be taken to, to get us on that path now after the great pause, after whatever comes after the great pause. So maybe we'd start again. Let's start with Fred Kent, who is the uh, the elder statement, statesman among us and who was uh, active on the streets here in 1970. So Fred, you know, when you look at the earth uh, as a place to make, as opposed to a, a planet we live on, what's your key priority going forward? Well, you know, I used to run an organization that had a lot of people. And then uh, two years ago, we broke off from that. We call it a hard fork. Uh, we moved to, because a group of us, the senior leadership thought we could do something much bigger if we didn't have an organization uh, around us that we had to serve and su support. So we set up this thing called Placemaking X and the Social Life Project. And they're network organizations. And it's so much fun because no longer do we have to use everyone in a large office, but we can reuse these people around the world. I just got an email this morning from Guyana where they need to reshape their whole downtown. Well, we have a whole network of people throughout Latin America who have great capacity in this and we can put together that network and come and help solve that problem. Uh, in three weeks ago, I was in Brisbane, Australia, and they have to redo their waterfront and uh, they have an enormous potential. Well, there are people that we are very close to around the world that are doing these kinds of things. Sometimes they're physical things, sometimes they're programmatic things, sometimes uh, they're much bigger uh, community organizing things like taking a whole city and turning it around in terms of creating places that serve people in different neighborhoods in different ways about creating community markets uh, throughout a city so that people who are trying to get into business can become part of a, a local market in their neighborhood one day a week, two days a week or whatever. Uh, so is a whole uh, evolution to where governance, place governance, place making, place governance, place led development is now moving very much into the mainstream. But there's one more level that I will say say about in a little bit. Okay. Uh, sorry. Hold on a second. Um, Alex, can you go next? Uh, we'll I'll tick down chronologically back into backwards. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So in 50 years' time, I mean, assuming Mike Gerard has sorted out decarbonization, and uh, you know we're all there. Um, I think that'll be great. I think there are some certain ways in which I, you know, trans transitioning the world from off fossil fuels or, or our ways of life, things that we think we know are unsustainable, um, towards a more sustainable way of living. Um, part of it, of course, involves government and it involves laws and all the rest of it, but also it, to some extent, it involves a relationship with the world that actually people have got to there's got to be some sense of a, a more human sense of of how we live in this world and it sounds uh people sometimes use the word stewardship that sounds a little bit colonial i don't like that but i mean it, it's it's more to do with how do we actually uh treat the world as something that we have to coexist with and figure out how we're going to work well with it in the future and you can see that a lot of people care about this i think there's more to come from the arts in particular but actually you're starting to see a lot coming out in the arts about people expressing their human feelings effectively in art or in music 
um, about the environment and what's happening to the planet. And that's a tremendously important thing that we have to develop here. And uh, Carol Becker here is Dean of the Arts is totally into this and, and keen to uh, move it forward. Um, but that human expression, that sense that this is this world is for us. And of course, we've got to deal with climate change. We've got to decarbonize. But actually, um, it's more than that. We've actually got to build a new sense of relationship with the world in which we live, the people we live with, the biosphere, and uh, and how we actually interact with the planet in a more uh, sustainable way going forward. So changing that mindset, I think, is massively important. And uh, you know, it, it may take a while. It may take crises to get there. But at the same time, I think it's a it's an important change in the way we need to think about um society it sounds rather utopian i know but I, can i just add a, a quick thought mm -hmm. uh we wrote an article about uh how the global catastrophe can be solved by local communities so mm -hmm. alex what you're saying is exactly that as they become engaged and they take ownership and they become uh movers and shakers and defining the place in their community better for themselves they are having a big impact on uh, sustainability and resilience and health issues. So by by diversifying all this, grounding it in the idea we would say place, you can have a big global impact quickly. And 50 years from now, I don't think we'll maybe even be around if we don't do something 10 years from now and 15 years yeah. from now. And that's where I would go big time. Yeah, I, think more, more interesting. Interesting. Sorry. I just want to quickly say, I mean, I think that's, I mean, you can see this with people choosing what they want to do in terms of their energy needs and making decisions about how they want to treat the environment today. And I think a lot of energy companies, you know, like 20 years ago, um, hadn't twigged to how strong public opinion might, 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 how much public opinion might bring to bear on their choices about what energy, uh, where they got their energy from. And that's a growing and important part of what happens, um, not just politically on the big stage, but also locally and in, in communities, like you say, Fred. So Maureen, I wanted to get from you a sense of um, science and, and this coming period. Um, we all know it matters hugely to have this body of data and, and, and modeling to underpin decisions. Um, so in your own head though, what's, what's, a, when you're, what's that world look like for you or your successors? Um, and what do you think can be done in the world of science as we know it today that can get us on that path quicker? Oh, and you're um, uh, muted. It's okay. Good, good. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with what was just said that how the world looks in 2070 from sea level to biospheres to the size of the polar ice sheets, all of that is gonna be dependent on the decisions that are being made now. There's there's such a long lag time in, in Earth's natural system. Um, so, you know, to you, the other thing I often like to say to people too is this is climate change is no longer a scientific problem. It, it's a problem that we all collectively in the world share now. And it's, you know, right now, um, it's all hands on deck moment. And this is a problem that will only be solved with collective action of governments through government regulation, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, yet at a global scale. Uh, for the business community, new ways of doing business, new ways of uh, moving energy and, and information around the world. It's gonna be solved by communities and our neighbors and our local governments. And most importantly, it's gonna be solved by the actions of individuals demanding that this problem be taken seriously. Um, and most, you know, the thing that gives me the most hope is seeing the passion of, of the younger generation and the fact that they are increasingly realizing that this is their future at stake. And, you know, please help us push forward on this statement, on this problem. So I am really optimistic. I have always been a huge believer in the power of science and human ingenuity to solve any problem that is thrown at it. And uh, I hope that the science that people do at Columbia and elsewhere around the world will be used to inform the best solutions and inform the path forward. But really, this is a collective problem now that we all need to solve. Well put. So, um, Narayan, again, um, you're, you have a good chance of being around in 2070. I, I'm pretty sure I haven't run the numbers, but yeah, I think so, especially if medical advances <laughs> keep going. So uh, you'll be in legacy mode then, looking back at 
what's the thing you will tell what what will you be telling your current self that was the smart step that you took that, that's different than what you might have other, otherwise done that got you on the track to success i I, I think a lot of that, um, a lot of what I hope I'll be saying in 2070 is that this particular moment and really over the last five years, um, kind of also culminating in uh, the Sunrise Movement and other kind of youth movements that have uh, really come to the fore over the last year, um, I hope to be able to say that those were the things that really galvanized uh, the climate movement finally uh, and pulled it across the finish line. And just a quick quick thing around that that, that I, I wanted to highlight which is uh, when you when you look at the original Earth Day, there, uh, I, I studied a lot of the history in college just because I was curious what what actually caused this moment to happen back in 1970. And there were a lot of events that kind of culminated with uh, with Earth Day, like the Cuyahoga River fire and these these focusing events that really made it clear to the public uh, that a lack of environmental protection was truly destructive to society and the economy. And I've always been curious, what, what is that moment for the climate? Um, because I mean, the climate crisis is a different beast uh, because the impacts, uh, there's a lag between uh, a, the lack of action and the actual impacts. But one of the things that I think has happened over the last couple of years, and this relates to work um, I did with the Marshall Islands, is in 2015, uh, so I was advising the uh, president and foreign minister of the Marshall Islands uh, in the lead up to the Paris uh, Agreement. And one of the things that we were fighting for was to get a recognition of this 1.5 degree Celsius temperature goal. And in the end, it ended up getting included in the agreement. One of the, but one of the things that people didn't realize that also got included as part of the agreement uh, was that there would be a special report that would be published within the next couple of years, uh, examining exactly what it would take to achieve that 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. And this is something the Marshall Islands helped secure. And it was just kind of slipped in and no one made much of a deal out of it. But what ended up happening is when that report got published last fall, that was the report that said that we have about 10 to 15 years to seriously alter uh, our, our, our actions as governments across the, uh, across the world. That was kind of the, the galvanizing moment for, for groups like the Sunrise Movement. Um, and so I think something similar is now happening with climate now that the, the time to which we have to act is much, much more clear. Uh, and to some extent that, that is to be credited to, to small island nations like the Marshall Islands uh, that are at the front lines of the climate crisis. That's, <laughs> that's a great thing. Yeah, I think that, that shows you that there are systems uh, solutions that are in policy as well. If, that, uh, if the IPCC hadn't been asked that question, What's the difference between 1.5 and 2? Think about what would not have happened going forward. And I guess that gets at the this sort of prismatic nature of thinking about this future. There's a role for everyone, policymaker, engineer, teacher, artist. Uh, that it's it feels monumentally large, but it's the largeness and complexity of the problem that lets everyone do something. So Maria, you have the final word in this round in, in the sense of thinking about what do you want to work on most that you think can get you that brighter outcome? Um, obviously, this is a hard question. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> we talked a lot about decarbonization. I think that's very important. Um, but I think a huge thing that we've seen with the COVID crisis is that it's shown big discrepancies in opportunities between different communities, um, especially the head of the frontline communities we've seen in the US, um, African Americans are disproportionately affected by COVID because of kind of long term systemic issues. So I think embracing that intersectionality within the climate movement is very important. Um, and things like having clean energy for all and like Wi Fi for all will kind of level the playing field to a certain extent. Um, I also think it's very important to lift up the voices of those groups. Indigenous people as well um, are disproportionately affected and we were talking earlier about kind of listening to the communities and things, um, and that's especially important here. I think there are a lot of people who kind of experts think they know everything, which, you know, you study this for a long time, you know a lot, but until you actually talk to the people on the front lines, you don't understand the issue fully. And I think trying to develop solutions without those people in the conversation could be a big problem. Um, I know Alex was talking about the climate school and how kind of Columbia deals with our community and the people outside of like the non-affiliates within the Harlem community. I think that's something Columbia has struggled with a lot, like 
through its whole history yeah. and something that undergraduates are very passionate about kind of seeing change. Um, we obviously, we have the new Manhattanville campus, which there are some issues with. Um, and I think I would like to see Columbia do better and I would like to see the climate movement also do better um, in the hope that kind of in 50 years, but really in five years, the people who are affected most are the voices that we hear and the people that we value the most in this movement. That's very well said. Uh, Fred is back with us too. I'm just gonna plug him into, yeah, that idea of inclusion, both uh, within the campus and how the campus relates to communities around it um, and how we all build our careers with that in mind. Uh, it's something I know is on everyone's mind at Columbia. The There was an important study of diversity in earth science that was done by Kueli Dutt, who's at uh, Lamont, that shows there's a lot of work to be done to create the, the rainbow diversity in our inquiry and outcomes that if you don't have that, you can't build the relationships with broad communities either. Um, there are some questions that have come in and I, we're gonna devote the next, the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes to some of them. They're great. Um, you know, we can follow up with some afterwards. This all gets archived as soon as we're done as videos and on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook. This is not a one-time thing, right? Columbia is in an or increasingly open, Earth, Earth, Earth Institute Live is, is a new initiative here that's uh, going forward will be a norm. It's not going to be, this is not a patch in how we relate to the world. So here's some questions um, uh, that come have come in. Um, any comment on the recent decision by Oxford to divert, divest from fossil fuels, passing a resolution this week that requires its endowment fund to divest from fossil fuel companies? I know, Alex, you were involved in a lot of conversations across the campus and uh, relating to this climate school and relating to these bigger questions. Uh, what's the latest thinking here? Yeah, so it's um, interesting. From a Columbia point of view, we've been talking about it a lot, um, both within the Earth Institute and more broadly. Um, so in moving forward with the, with the climate school, uh, Columbia from the leadership down, from the top of Columbia down, is thinking about what else we need to do in terms of decarbonizing the campus and changing the way we do things. And part of that includes the question of divestment. Uh, and the, um, I think the, you know, we're, out, we're in some ways, um, we're not actively engaged in investing in any fossil fuel companies directly at the moment. We decarbonized from, sorry, we, we divested from um, coal a couple of years ago, but actually we don't have any, as far as I can tell, any investments directly in oil companies. But the trouble is you have these portfolios of investment that, are, that actually move around and they're actually um, driven a certain way. So we're looking at that as well. And the trustees are thinking about how best to do that. There is one important aspect of this that I think um, is worth making. I've talked to a number of great people about this, including Jeremy Grantham, who's written a lot of stuff about it, or who's uh, uh, talked a lot about it. Um, the I think the key thing to think about is how are we going to work with a lot of these companies in the future because in the future we're going to need these companies to tell us how to put carbon dioxide in the ground they they are the only ones who actually operate at scale uh, on these particular issues so we've got to build some way of working with companies while at the same time having the goal of um, trying to decarbonize and thereby actually um, if you like what we're trying to do is to um, remove their business model and actually sort of work in the opposite direction. So I think there's a there's an important discussion to be had about how are you going to make that work, uh, and I think that has to be uh, you know a, a deep intelligent discussion that we have across our university. Uh, that it's not just about um, seeing these people as poisoning the planet and, and and wrecking the planet, even if that's true. The fact is we need to work with these companies and actually make them part of the solution going forward. And there are some indications, partly uh, due to the influence of uh, financial investment companies and partly due to uh, the fact that certain companies are getting such a bad reputation and trying to do something about it, um, that they're thinking about how to do something about that. So I think, um, so there's, there's that aspect to it. In terms of which particular universities um, go down which routes, I think you need to look quite carefully of what they really say they're going to do and and what that might mean and it's the same with companies who talk about you know being carbon neutral by 2050 
we need to understand what that actually might mean and how they're going to do it. It could mean just buying up a whole load of photovoltaic companies. So um, understanding that, I think, is quite important as we take the conversation forward. And by the way, much of what you just stated applies to food as well um, and many commodities going forward. Um, uh, actually, Michael Puma here at Columbia at the Earth Institute and works with NASA, he's part of a co-authored study that just came out a couple of days ago showing that while we, I think a lot of us would like to think, uh, we think locally about food and you know what can we get from our local farmer's market. Their study found that um, a pretty solid analysis that um, a maximum of a third of the planet can get food locally. That that trade, global trade and basic things uh, is a fundamental part of feeding the planet going forward through 2070 and beyond, especially with climate change, with the dynamics underway, other scientists here have studied you can have multiple droughts affecting food production. Some of this will have to be global too. So operating within that reality, as opposed to thinking we're all gonna have a small traditional life feels like a part of the mix too. So it's very similar. And food is a very consequential part of the climate problem too. There's yeah. another couple of other points here that are good to get in. Um, uh, Laurie Abel, uh, she's making a point here that's reflecting what was just said, I think. It's it's a mistake to think of the global economy right now as a, in standstill. The global economy is slowly changing and adapting right now is a moment to steer it towards the future we want. We don't have an economist on the panel today, but we do have people who think a lot about this. And um, maybe Narayan and, and Maria, you know, um, how much of this feels to you as an opportunity. It's it's a terrible, devastating impact, both economically, tens of millions of people out of jobs, including many I know. Um, yet it's in that it's necessary right now to think about the future too, because trillions of dollars are going to be spent in the next few years trying to reboot things. So um how important is seeing this as a way to not just build back what was here? Maria, so, maybe yeah. Um I think it's as horrible as it sounds, um, it is a really good opportunity. Um, there's a lot of people who have lost jobs and if we want to have a clean energy revolution, we need a lot of people to help with that. Um, my mom's family is from Ohio um, and they lost a lot of jobs kind of with the steel industry and everything kind of went downhill um, a while ago. And I think in places like that, you can basically reemploy a bunch of people. Um, and also change minds about what climate change is and kind of educate people um, through providing jobs. Because as soon as kind of sustainable energy is seen as a positive thing that's providing jobs and providing opportunities for people, people in areas that traditionally don't believe in sustainability or like don't understand what we're going through, um, we'll start to see it as a positive. So I'm kind of hoping that that's the route that's taken um, we'll see if it is, but I think that's a, it is an opportunity for that. Uh, Maureen, there's one here that is in your arena. Um, uh, Adrian, who's here at the Earth Institute posted it, but it came from an email. It's about accuracy in climate models uh, and the like. Um, how accurate are the current models? Are there models that are better uh, or have been proved to be the most accurate in the last 20 years? Uh, why are there so many different ones? Uh, not a general comprehensive model. If you want, we could look at that more generally at the, what's the importance of models? Even though we know, as Gavin Schmidt here has said many times, all models are wrong, but they're useful. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the key tenets of earth science is the past is the key to the future. And, um, you know, what we do is we study the planet, we study it in real time, we study how it's behaved in the past, and we try to build mathematical computer models that describe all the processes that we see and the physics of the system and the chemistry of the system and the biology of the system, which is the most complicated part to put into these models. And the, these are the models that are used to predict where we will be 50 years from now. For instance, if we keep putting CO2 into the atmosphere at the rate we are doing, what will the surface temperature likely be in 2075 or 2100? Uh, what will the ocean temperature likely be? Um, how how widespread will droughts be? How uh, frequent and severe will storms like hurricanes become? And these are all uh, all questions that we study in the past and we query models in the future. 
And uh, why are there so many different models? I mean, this is a fundamental tenet of science too, is reproducibility and different people, different lab groups, you know, parameterize things differently. And so you are gonna get a, an array of predictions and you will, you know, think, okay, let's look at the average. What's the average going forward? And, and maybe every now and then some model does a huge outlier prediction and the whole community will say, why did it do that? And really dig into it and try to figure out if it was something they got right or something they got wrong. And it's just how science works going forward. So, you know, I would never put my faith in one model, for instance. I mean, I wanna see a, a collective answer. And by the way, that's come to the fore in the news flow around coronavirus, um, that people, if it, it's with, not just with models, but with particular papers, never look at one paper. Right. Uh, I call it single study syndrome. Is, is This is something the media are pretty bad at because we just leap from one new paper to the next and the, the reader or viewer can get whiplash if you do that too much and disengage. So some of this is about understanding how science works as well in a bigger way. Yes. Um, and I just... Yeah, I was going to say, if, if this is a good time to start to, to wrap us forward um, toward an Okay. Ending. Well, I just wanted to quickly say on the modeling thing, there are ways in which, actually, if you look at a lot of the models coming out now, they're in pretty close agreement in terms of if you put the same sorts of parameters in and that kind of thing. The question is what's going to happen in the future, and trying to predict what will happen in the future very much depends on not just on the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but how carbon dioxide and other things uh, then trigger um, further uh, runaway effects. And so people are concerned about the how well we can predict that, and that there's a lot that is really unknown. Um, and even the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, uh, people have worked on that for a long time. There's now evidence that, that may be, um, there may be changes in that as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So I think we've, there's a there's a lot to worry about in terms of the future, in terms of how well you can predict it. Most of the models actually sort of tracking it right now, uh, uh, temperature change and CO2 change are in pretty close, close agreement. And it's partly because we actually are understanding the Earth system better as time goes on, uh, as, we, uh, as we get more data. Right, Alex is right. It's like the biggest uncertainty in where we'll be 50 years from now, it's not from the models, it's from what we do as humans to the CO2 level in the atmosphere. Right. If I can just add to that, um, yeah. my, my recent work has actually been studying how the models inform policy, inform law. Um, and one of the things, so we did a, a sweep of um, 13 different jurisdictions, national and subnational across the world, looking at how they used uh, technical modeling, scientific modeling, um, to then inform their decarbonization plans up to 2050 and how do they actually make them durable and then how often do they revisit these models and assumptions and uh, how often do they do that? Uh, and that's really important. That's where I think um, you know, we need policy to be nimble enough to take into consideration developments in the science and developments in the modeling, um, both the modeling around climate science but also the modeling around uh, the technical pathways, how, how fast our uh, clean energy technology is going to get cheap enough to quickly transition uh, and the like. So there's a lot that I think policymakers and, and lawyers have to do as well to be uh, internalizing these models and uh, revisiting them as well. So we are um, at 1128. We're pretty much at the end of our program. There's some good comments that have come in, questions. Eugene Kerman makes the point about being, how do we uh, create that line so we can discuss the science and have everyone engage on the policy questions uh, on a on a landscape that's broader than just the data. That that's always an issue, um, and I think one of the important things that you, you've demonstrate uh, all of you in your work here at the Earth Institute and Fred in your work, which is, seems to be all about listening to communities in design, is um, knowing that there's a diverse landscape of views of data, and that's also scientific. There's this field called cultural cognition, which guarantees we'll never see the data with one eyeball and one decision process. And I think this is the conclusion of our exercise today in the sense that, but this is not the conclusion of anything. Columbia is a communicative enterprise. The Earth Institute is devoted to this live relationship with uh, the, the world around us and the world within us. And Alex, you get the final word here and, and sort of calling it a day. And, could, I, could, and I have a, a, could I have a sentence before? Uh, a sentence, yes. Yes. Yep. 
So our view is that, that each discipline has become its own audience and that convergence and doing things quickly, lighter, quicker, cheaper to create change and then use the disciplines to, to assess that, respond to it, use it for the next level, but keep moving progressively to create, continue to create change, systemic change on the ground brings the outcomes that we will want in the long term. Hmm. I love that line. Each discipline has become its own audience. We want to avoid that, right? <laughs> Right. And I think we're doing a good job of that it's, it's on hard. this program. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. It was a great insight. And by the way, I'm going to be doing another one of these Sustain Wet programs just specifically on placemaking because it's a fascinating enterprise. This is, the, again, not the beginning. This is not the end. This is the beginning of a, a new approach to our That's interconnectivity. Great. It's really, really important. Thank you. So, Alex. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you uh, to everybody who's been speaking today, uh, to uh, Maria and to Narayan, who I think in 50 years' time will probably be wondering whether they should retire as dean of their climate school somewhere in the world. Um, <laughs> and to uh, Mike Gerard, of course, and Fred, who are outstanding in terms of what they're doing and providing a great perspective on what things were like 50 years ago. And then to Maureen Ramo, who gave us that insight into the history of Colombia and in particular the Lamont Valley Earth Observatory and how climate science has been at the core of our understanding of the planet and where we need to go in the future. And finally, thanks to Andy for a great job of fielding all the discussion and, and making us all feel quite relaxed and comfortable with what we're saying. Thanks a lot. Great. And you, all you listeners. So. <laughs> yes, and, and those whose questions weren't uh, answered, uh, again, I'm an open book. I'm here for everyone. Yeah. Uh, to serve as a as a pipeline, and we're going to keep this going. So thank thank you all, uh, and I'm going to call it a day. Uh, in, one, in in one p.m. today, Eastern time, I'm doing a um, another sustain what program with uh, George Steinmetz, one of the great photographers of the of the Anthropocene. He uh, I I got to write the context of the text and essays for his book. He just flew over Manhattan last week, and CBS News covered his light over the quiet city. So um, Fred, uh, I mean, George is an amazing character giving us another perspective on this changing planet. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you again soon.